hello again. Here we are, and today uh, I want to bring you a word of exhortation about uh, why we have, uh, uh, why the need for greed. Why the need for greed? Why is it so prevalent, it seems, everywhere? Greed has seeped into every aspect of life. Greed is a toxic fog that silently pervades us. Just look at the term, the love of money. This subject ought to be looked at in greater detail. The term uh, money is used some 125 odd times in the King James Bible. And of course, the subject of money matters is scattered right throughout the Bible and the scriptures. I should probably do a study just on this subject alone. On the subject of greed, I'd like you to read this quote from Abraham Lincoln. I find it quite chilling. It was definitely prophetic. It was made at a time when seven out of eight men were self-employed, you know, farmers and miners, this type of thing. Uh, small business owners, working with small business. But he foresaw the rise of what would become imperial corporations. Imperial in the sense that they were bigger than the uh, countries that hosted them. We're at this point well and truly when very few people are self-employed or running what could be called small business. I remember when I came uh, to Australia, uh, New South Wales, something like uh, over 80% of the people employed were employed by self-employed or small business. That, of course, is not the case now. The vast majority of people who vote in our Western democracies are working for the government directly, working for some government agency or associated not-for-profit come charity, or large multinational corporations, or who are the recipients of some type of welfare. These are the perfect conditions for wealth to be accumulated within the power of a very few. And we Christians need to avoid greed and stand against it. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth, and if this flavor, it is this flavor that keeps back the chaos, confusion, and twilight. Now here's what Lincoln said. Lincoln said, we may congratulate ourselves that this cruel war is nearing its end. It has cost a vast amount of treasure and blood. It has indeed been a trying hour for the Republic, but I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. As a result of the war, corporations have been enthroned and an area of corruption in high places will follow and the money power of the country will endeavour to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudice of the people until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. I feel at this moment more anxiety for the safety of my country than ever before even in the midst of war. God grant that my suspicions may prove groundless. There is no doubt that the massive and destructive downturn of our economic future in 2008 was laid squarely at the outcomes of unregulated greed. Ever since the Scottish economic model was produced, this model ended up promoting the idea that society would move forward when everybody in that society tried to arrive at their own personal best. And since then our culture has been doomed to wallow in greed. I notice that in the USA they're trying to move hard on insider trading in the wake of the recent financial disasters, but you have to ask the question, how many of the per perpetu perpetuators have ever actually been prosecuted in sentences? Sentence. More importantly, the financial sector should be firmly regulated and not left to being manipulated by a greedy few. 
you should not find it surprising that wherever there are national disasters, that the stock, ex stock exchange uh, working around those affected nations suddenly surges because greedy people realise they can profit from needy people. One of the main reasons that the Western economy collapsed was because the foundations of home mortgages were subtly altered to allow massive speculation, which also included speculation using uh, insurance against uh, the failure, their speculation failure, you know, like a sort of double indemnity, as it were, where, where uh, these uh, were traded on a massive scale. This is much the same as what's behind the, the carbon tax in our country. Uh, that tax produces money which intends to be traded on a massive scale. And of course, wherever you've got speculation and trading, you've got risk. Sure, you have profit, but you also have risk. But you have the manipulation by the few to gain the maximum benefit. When I was young, a true savings uh, bank account was protected and a true mortgage of the family home was also protected. This protection was guaranteed by the government of the day. Unfortunately, this is no longer the case. The new style savings and mortgage accounts that you can get today are not the traditional protected accounts but are in the form of investment accounts and as such carry no such government protections. Superannuation has suffered the same fate. Do not be misled by the term superannuation guarantee. This is just a guarantee that all employers must pay superannuation on behalf of their employees. It most certainly is not a guarantee that the employees will be able to collect it. That depends on market forces. This new policy has produced speculation of the markets on a truly massive scale. And when you see the current commercial ads for superannuation funds, make sure that you listen very carefully to the wording of those advertisements. Western democracies, which for the majority of the past 200 years have understood that they had to regulate financial freedoms in order to protect the very people they govern, have in the last three decades systematically remove regulation from the financial sector to find themselves left with the care and responsibility of the people but no control over the money to do so in an effective manner. This unbalanced mechanism is driven by greed. When greed drives a nation, an economy, a business entity, a church, a family or an individual the end result is that somebody, somewhere, pays a massive price. The Bible warns against greediness. The trouble is that enough is never enough to a greedy person. I'd like you to follow me through a few scriptures that highlight how the Word of God views greed and greediness. And we'll start with Paul's admonition to Timothy about food and raiment. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 5-11 to 11. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. What do you do with a set of scriptures like this? The scriptures strike at the very heart of the problem and correctly describe the situation today. 
Should you let the scriptures change your lifestyle? In view of all the various teachings about prosperity of the people of God, we should know precisely what the Bible has to say on this subject. It hasn't helped that since the year 2000 and the introduction of the GST in Australia, for instance, uh, churches are now classified officially as not-for-profit businesses. <laughs> the church was never intended to be a business. Oh dear. Are these verses relevant to our right lifestyle today? We live in a day when the gap between the rich and the poor of this world is growing exponentially. The people of God need sound teaching in this area. Is it po possible that we can drown in destruction and perdition like this, these verses say? Absolutely. No grace of God is irresistible and we are all held accountable for what we have and what we do with it. I think this scripture in Proverbs should sum up our attitude. Proverbs chapter 30, 8 to 9. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. This is the correct moderate idea because anything more or less than this opens the doorway to being overcome by temptation. To me, it is very similar to the injunction of a married couple. A married couple are to maintain their intimate relationship or else it would open the doorway to being overcome by temptation. What does the term will be rich really mean? The desire to be rich. Rich is defined as the opposite of poor. The moderate form of lifestyle is clearly described here. If you have enough food and raiment, raiment could be described as having a reasonable accommodation to live within your society and culture. How do we relate to the love of money? To love something is to desire it and to want to make it yours. If I have the love of money, does this mean that I will err from the faith? The love of money is one of the greatest causes for people, particularly preachers, to err from the faith. They have erred from the faith, the scripture says. To err is, is slightly different from the meaning of to fall away. Sexual misadventure, unforgiveness, bitterness will all cause you to fall away. When you err from the faith, you take a wrong turn, you lose your way. And if you are leading others, you might, they might also follow you down this path and so become lost as well. Think about the term gain is godliness. Contrary to popular belief, it is not a sign of godliness to have more than enough. When the Apostle Paul talked about having a prosperous journey, he did not mean that he made a lot of money. It means that he arrived successfully to his destination. That is, his journey accomplished what he set out to do. Romans chapter 1 verse 10. Making request, if by any means, now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Now, you can see here the first time this word is used in the King James Bible, and it gives us a clear reference to understanding it. It's found in Genesis 24:21, And the man, wandering at her, held his peace, to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. He was looking for a wife for the son of his master, and it had absolutely nothing to do with making a lot of money. Isn't the teaching of prosperity that gain is godliness or a sign of God's blessing a common enough sentiment among Christians today? Does the word of God really mean that if you think that or behave in a way that promotes the concept that gain is godliness, you will be perverse, corrupt-minded, and destitute of the truth? Let's look at verse 7 again. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. 
The people that suppose that gain is godliness have perverse disputings coming out from corrupt minds that are destitute of the truth. Regardless of what you may think of the fruit of their ministry, the solution for us is to withdraw ourselves. Surely this verse is clear enough. It is no good arguing that you think that the character and disposition of a person, minister or not, is any different from this if they promote the concept that financial gain is a sign of godliness. Such people are of a corrupt mind and destitute of the truth. To me the central theme is having food and raiment, let us be content. Verse 11 tells us plainly what to flee and what to follow. This surely means that we are not to chase after or desire riches and we certainly should not have a love of money. The hardest person to judge righteously and effectively is yourself. The scriptures say that the perfect have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. It's always difficult to get to the root and the source of some issues within our lives. This is especially true when we are endeavouring to discern the actual motivation behind our actions. For instance, which is the better? To copyright and sell your gospel material and then to donate the proceeds in a charitable way or make your gospel material completely free of charge with no copyright entitlements at all. I prefer to take Paul's stance. He didn't want the reward of man. He wanted the reward of God and he always endeavoured to make the gospel free of charge. I believe this is worthy of emulation as far as my personal approach is concerned. I don't judge anybody else's approach and I admire the people who give away all their royalties. I like to be very careful not to let my left hand know what my right hand is doing. This passage also talks about foolishness. You know, foolishness in the King James Bible sense is not funny. It's the opposite of wisdom. It's foolish, foolhardy, lacking in faith. When we look at verse 11, there is a significant difference between the idea of avoiding and fleeing. When I avoid somebody, I do not listen to their ministry, sit under their authority, or have them enjoying the open hospitality of my household. I separate myself from them. So I avoid the teachers and preachers of fables and corrupt doctrine and I flee as far away as possible from any temptation that would draw me away from the living faith. Paul tells Timothy that he should both avoid certain people and flee away from certain temptations. I like to avoid and flee. I like to run away at full speed any suggestion to my heart and soul that I hunger after riches or desire money. Jesus had a lot to say about the subject of hell and he also had a lot to say about the subject of the use of money. I think the principle that God the Father wants us to learn is to rely on him moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, for all of our needs, spiritual or material. Our period of time spent in this life is tiny when compared to that which we will spend in eternity. Don't you find it interesting that the human mind wants to make it millions of years from the past for us to arrive at this point, you know, evolution, from where we will then transcend into nothing when we die, and that the Bible and creation makes it no time at all to arrive at this point, a mere 6,000 years, where we are now to then transcend into billions of years in the future. Evolution establishes a backward train of millions of years and billions of years with nothing to look forward to when we die and Christianity accounts for a moment of time from creation to the judgment as compared to the billions and years of eternity of everlasting glory. Go figure, obviously the natural mind and the mind of God don't really fit into the same universe. The system of values that you need to be at peace with God is completely different from the system of values that you would naturally adopt if you lived entirely within the scope of this present world. And that also includes how you view and deal with money. The expression, some coveted after, 
is clearly shown to express the danger of ending up making a shipwreck of your faith and falling away from the truth. One could argue that not everybody who covets after money will lose their way, but the warning is quite definite. The vision in the Minor Prophets about the flying roll eating away the foundations of the household refers to matters that go hand in hand and really are summed up in the word greed. This role had the curses of bearing false witness on the one side and the curses of covetousness on the other side and it came and settled in certain households and ate them away. Bearing false witness, that is, in actual fact, telling lies on the one hand and on the other hand, covetousness, coveting what you do not have, in actual fact is seen as stealing money or possessions which can be exchanged for it. In other words, a life driven by greed. Are we really called to live greedily? No, we are not. We are really called to live moderately. That is to live in a controlled way. Moderation does not mean a middle path in the King James Bible. It means controlled, bringing your body and life under subjection to the Word and the Spirit of God. Now someone's going to say I'm legalistic. Well, I'm not legalistic, but I believe that the Word of God is to be obeyed, that we follow Christ in a school of obedience. If that's legalistic, well, then I am. Moderation. You can arrive at the meaning of the word by looking at its use in the scriptures. Joel 2.23 Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And then this word again in Philippians 4.5 Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. The former rain moderately. The former rain was the rainfall needed after the ground was cultivated and the crops had been sown to bring it to its first really important growth. These rains had to come in a controlled manner at the right time of year, each year, otherwise there would be no new crops to eat and in the right density of rainfall, otherwise there would be massive soil erosion. This seasonal rainfall was guaranteed by the promise of God to his people who walked after his ways. You know, it's interesting that the land of their slavery was watered by the River Nile, both by flooding and man-made irrigation. But the land of promise that Abraham actually inherited was a land of hills and valleys and meadows that needed constant regular rain to provide water. This is a totally different type of watering system. If the rains didn't come in a predictable and controlled manner, there would be no harvest. The latter rain was the rain that failed to allow the crops to mature properly just before the harvest time. You may remember how Jericho had lousy water, and all the crops did not produce seed that germinated or the fruit that came to proper maturity it dropped from the, from the uh, tree and just rotted. I do think that clean, abundant water is going to be a major problem for the populations of the world, no matter where you live. Anyway, the idea here is that the moderately means controlled rather than a middle path between two extremes. If God blesses you with more than enough, you can always counter the tendency to greed by becoming more generous. We are really just in charge of, or rather stewards of, a great warehouse of our life. And I've always thought that it would be nice, instead of keeping 90% and giving away 10%, to be able to give away 90% and keep 10%. I have been able to manage this a few times in my life as an ongoing experience. Here are a few scriptures that help explain that greed and the need for gain is not a good attitude. We'll start in Leviticus 19.10. 
And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger, for I am the Lord your God. When you're greedy, you don't, you glean. You strip everything off. The subject of gleaning is often completely misunderstood in trying to apply the principle of diligent business, brother. You've got to be diligent. It's imperative to be fair in all of your dealings, business or otherwise. We are not to drive hard for the best bargain and deal that we can possibly achieve. The underlying principle is to treat other people as we'd like to be treated ourselves. This is a very good example of how the King James Bible defines its own words. When you refuse to glean, you always leave something behind or on the table for someone else, including the poor and the stranger. Deuteronomy 24.21 When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. Once again you can see that the principle of not being greedy and taking everything that is there to take is applied by the word of God to make provision for others. Psalm 10.3 For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom God abhorreth. That's a very strong language. You most certainly do not want to be covetous and greedy. They go hand in hand. Proverbs 1.13 We shall find all precious substance. We will fill our houses with spoil. Proverbs 1.15 My son, walk not thou in the way with them, refrain thy foot from their path. Proverbs 1.19 So are the ways of every one that is greedy of game, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Those who are greedy of gain always diminish their own lives as they seek to diminish the lives of the people with whom they deal. This greediness actually destroys their own lives and they destroy themselves with their greed. Proverbs 11.24 there, that, that there is that scattereth and yet increaseth, there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but tendeth to poverty. Greediness tends to poverty. The person who is liberal is made fat and so actually increases. The person who doesn't, uh, holds everything to themselves, to, supposedly to their best advantage, ends up being lean. Proverbs 11.25 The liberal soul should be made fat, and he that watereth should be watered also himself. What a promise. Proverbs 15.27 He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. The greedy shake the foundations of their own house, just like the vision of the flying roll. Proverbs 21.26 He covereth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Greediness becomes a way of life and tends to abject poverty. Isaiah 56.11 Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. The greedy can never be satisfied and will never have enough. This verse has some rather chilling connotations, especially when you think about what Paul had to say about his fellow ministers of the gospel in Philippians 2, 20, 21. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ. For all seek their own, this harkens straight back to that, previous verse. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. This statement by Paul used to make me very sad that he should end up in, in the fruit of his life of ministry with only one minister that he had trained in the work of the Lord, that is Timothy, who was like-minded as himself to care for the welfare of the people more than his own gain. <laughs> These days experience has taught me that I should be grateful that there was at least one Ezekiel 22.12 In thee have they taken gifts to shed blood, thou hast taken usury and increase, 
thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbours by extortion, and hast forgotten me, saith the Lord God. I find it amazing that Christians like to put a different spin on so many matters. Take, for instance, usury. Usury is not the application of punery interest. It is the application of any interest at all. The people of God were not to charge interest one to another. They were to lend expecting not to receive again. And those that borrow expected to pay back not because they are made to, but because they ought to. You must learn to keep your word on your promises. The verse says, taken gifts to shed blood, means that they had accepted bribes in order to give false witness. When you do these things, you forget that the Lord is your provider. Greed will drive the need to have God as your provider far away from you, and you will eventually forget the one who has provided for you. Ephesians 4.19, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Greediness makes you unclean. You will also end up past feeling. In other words, your conscience will just shut down and you'll not be able to hear its voice anymore. Who wants to end up there? 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, no brawler, but not covetous. Greedy of filthy lucre is just another way of saying having a love of money. 1 Timothy 3.8, likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Any type of church leadership or church oversight demands a pure example being set to the rest of the congregation. You can definitely see that such people are not to be greedy at all. Titus 1.7 For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. Greediness is another way of saying not given to filthy lucre. Do not be like those that Jude describes. For there are certain men crept in unawares. So they're already here amongst us in the church. Jude chapter 1, 11 to 13. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. They have run greedily after the er error of Balaam for reward and perished with the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You know, Jude links these men uh, together. Woe well unto them. These three individuals show the three linked traits, covetousness, greed, and despising godly authority. These traits go hand in hand. Surely you can see from the above verses that greediness should not be once named amongst Christians. You can see from these references that greed is definitely something to be avoided. You will not enjoy a happy, peaceable life that walks within the spiritual man if you are greedy. Greediness and holiness just do not go together. So let's have a look at a few examples of the right spirit in this matter. Moses shows us the true attitude. Hebrews 11:25 to 26 Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the rich, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. This second verse doesn't get quoted that much. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. We want our reward in heaven. We don't look for it down here. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the riches that than let me read it again. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. That's what we're looking for. Deuteronomy fifteen eleven to fifteen. For the poor shall never cease out of the land, therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in the land. 
And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out from the out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress of that where with the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee, this thing today. We are called to open our hand wide to our brethren, to poor and needy. We are to help them liberally, especially of the household of faith. Galatians 6.10 And we therefore, we ha- as we therefore, <laughs> sorry, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And again in Isaiah 32, 8. But the liberal deviseth liberal things, and by liberal things shall he stand. When you are liberal, you are actively looking for ways to demonstrate your liberality, and the Lord will make sure that he meets your needs. The Lord is no man's debtor. 1 Corinthians 16, 3. And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, Then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. They sent financial support to the saints in Jerusalem who were suffering a huge downturn in their welfare. They gave back of their material things because they had received from the saints in, in Jerusalem such spiritual riches. 2 Corinthians 8, 2 to 3. How that, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. This is a great testimony, and you should certainly want to be someone who can claim it for yourself. Liberally abounding, with joy out of deep poverty, oh, this is power! Second Corinthians 9.13 Whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. Attitudes of character are always experimental and our liberal distribution and generosity show that the confession of our subjection to the gospel of Christ is a reality. James 1.5 If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upholdeth not, and it shall be given to him. God only knows how to give liberally. That's how he gives. It's not only wisdom that he gives liberally. We should be a people who are liberal and generous to a fault. Attitudes of generosity, liberality and hospitality are the traits of the followers of Jesus Christ. Do not be fooled by the false teachings of those who seem to be leaders and like to refer to the so-called hidden or deeper meanings from in the Greek and Hebrew texts into thinking that there are many signs of being filled to overflowing with the Holy Ghost and that hospitality and liberality is the ministry of a few specially chosen by God only. I think this explains why the modern charismatic church likes to always have a ministry to the poor rather than believers themselves ministering to those that they find in need in opening up their homes in hospitality, etc. Yes, there are guidelines within the scriptures that gives us wisdom and shows us how to be liberal and hospitable, but we should always be ready to do so. Abraham and Lot. Now this is a classic in my mind, a classic demonstration of not having greed. Genesis thirteen seven to 13 And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Pezodite dwelled then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we are brethren. 
Is not the whole of the land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. And if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan. And it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from the other. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Abraham was the older. Abraham was the one with the promises. Abraham was the boss. Surely he had a right to the best pasture and the best lands. But what is his attitude? He says to Lot, in effect, you take what you want and I'll have what is left. He was able to say this because he knew that God was his provider. I think this is a tremendous attitude. Liberality is rewarded in the scriptures over and over and over. Proverbs 11, 24, 26. There is that, there is that scattereth and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him, but blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. You see, the greedy person refuses to sell corn in a time of need in order that the demand for the corn will increase and the price will go up and so will his profit will be greater because he's greedy he does this. In other words, people go without because he's greedy. In places of disaster today, when people do such things, they're called profiteers, and you see it all over the place. But the principle of making undue profit is akin to being greedy. Controlling supply so the price remains high is exactly how the diamond industry behaves. We Christians are not to be greedy. We are not to engage in practices that promote undue profit. Let me lead you, leave you with the biblical picture of a godly person. Ezekiel 18, 5-9 But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath he lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath he defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath he come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, he that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that he hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly, he is just, he shall surely live, saith the Lord God. You really do need to be free from greed and to be totally liberal and generous, because you were once lost and destitute. Now you're forgiven and found. And I say to you, praise God and give God the glory, and act like people who have God as your bountiful supply. Glory to God. You can afford to have an open hand. You do not need to be greedy. What you need to do is to be thankful to be rejoicing and to be grateful and to be generous and to be kind. Praise his mighty blessed name and to keep rejoicing that you were once lost but you are now found and that the Lord himself is your great provider. So let's keep rejoicing and full of joy and let the joy abound, hallelujah, as we glorify God together and praise his mighty blessed name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs>